Joanne, and hi everyone. It's late in the afternoon. Um, great for people with dementia like me who have a bit of sundowning here and there and time with conferences. So I'm going to talk about what I've termed prescribed disengagement. It doesn't show up in the literature yet, um, but when I get around to uh, writing something academic about it, it will show up in the literature. Um, but it negatively impacts people's quality of life. So what is prescribed disengagement? When I was diagnosed with dementia aged 49, five years ago, I was told by my doctors and by service providers and by everyone around me to uh, give up work to give up tertiary study, to go home and to live for the time I had left. Whatever that means, after you've given up everything you like doing. And I chose to ignore that. And I didn't term it prescribed disengagement at the time, but I've come to realise that that is exactly what it is. So instead of pulling out the prescription pad, and prescribing me Aricept or one of the other Alzheimer's drugs. I didn't have Alzheimer's, but I think probably people with Alzheimer's are told to go home, give up work, give up life, and live for the time they've got left. Um, I was basically told to give up everything I love doing. And the first few weeks, perhaps the first few months, I uh, spent a lot of time very distressed about that. Like Richard Taylor, I cried just about every waking moment when I wasn't busy for the first few weeks. And then I took to writing to help me sort of work out what's going on in my life. But that medical model of disengaging from a pre-diagnosis life supports and exacerbates social inequality, stigma, isolation and discrimination. So what's the cost? It disempowers us. It disempowers our family carers. It focuses on the symptoms of the disease, not on the person. It devalues us. It ensures our self-esteem is lowered. Once we've given up work and all the things we like, what's left of our identity, we become Mr. or Mrs. Dementia. We lose employment if we're people with younger onset dementia. Therefore, the financial burden on our families is significant and on society. We have increased health costs, we have increased travel costs. I lost my licence when I was 50, so the impact of the cost of providing transport for me or my husband having to give up work um, or give up periods of time during his work to get me around um, so there's a financial burden to that, not just a, an emotional one. And it very negatively impacts quality of life and well-being. So these two models I have here are not evidence-based. Why They won't show up in the research. They're things that I've put together. So when I was diagnosed, I got the diagnosis, which took some time. I was prescribed disengagement from my pre-diagnosis life and at that time I wasn't even referred to an appropriate service provider. At 49 you're supposed to connect with the aged care sector and the aged care sector doesn't kick in until you're 65. So there wasn't anywhere to go. The disability sector, I was at university and I chose to stay at university. I had counselling from uh, one of my lecturers, she sent me to the disability sector. Um, they accepted my diagnosis after getting a letter from my doctor. They didn't question it. They did a full assessment of my disabilities. They told me to get some rehabilitation. They told me I could continue to remain engaged in tertiary education. They set up strategies to support me and they worked, helped me work on my quality of life and well-being through remaining meaningfully engaged. So this is a bit more about what I term the medical model of disengagement. 
And at the time, I wasn't even referred to an Alzheimer's association in my area. These days in Australia, younger onset dementia um, patients are referred to a link worker. We have a memory loss course in Australia for both the person with dementia and their family carer or family and friends, and there are support groups available. And then there are activities, bingo, art, coffee, groups, coffee groups, music therapy, hair brushing even, smelling fresh flowers, um, a safe return bracelet that's got in clear writing safe return, which is completely undignified for a person to wear. If I have a medical ailment, I put a little symbol on it, but with, this, with dementia, you wear a safe return bracelet. So the support offered um, was planning for my future, for my demise, was coping with the behaviour changes, was preparing my home for things like falls, um, when I got a bit older for community and respite care, and to perhaps go and visit some nursing homes for residential aged care. I was 49. So with that comes increased stigma, discrimination, isolation, loneliness and social inequality. There's a high risk of depression and there's a negative impact on the progression of dementia, in my opinion. It is negative, it disempowers us. It sets up what I call the martyr and victim roles. It set me up to become a victim and a sufferer. And it set my husband up to be a carer, an overprotective, perhaps martyr style carer. It does increase the stigma and discrimination. It steals our voice because it disempowers us. And it ignores the fact that people with dementia are the real experts about the disease. We live with it, we know what it's like. On the other hand, the disability model, which I was lucky enough to be at university, I was referred immediately to a disability advisor. There was no discrimination of my dis disability, of my illness. There was complete acceptance once the medical forms were through. I was set up with a mentor and a buddy, a disability access plan. I had alternative assessments uh, and exams set up. I was provided free counselling um, in class. I was provided with a note taker and podcasts afterwards. They set me up with strategies to help me manage time, uh, with maps or my buddy to help me get ar around uni. They uh, provided strategies to help me with reading and writing and uh, assistive technology, um, disability equipment, referral to careers and employment. Not that anyone was willing to employ me then. Um, and it reduced the stigma. There was no discrimination. I was still a whole person at university, just a person with disabilities. It definitely <coughs> reduced that social inequality. It was definitely more meaningful, more positive, more engaging. And I do believe that it has helped slow the progression of dementia. The neuroplasticity, the brain training that comes with advanced tertiary study, and I'm doing a Master's of Science degree at the University of Wollongong this year, and I need a lot of strategies to get through it. That's far more meaningful for me than doing luminosity or some other stupid brain game. <laughs> and I can guarantee it's enhanced my well-being and my quality of life. So it is positive, it's empowering, I could have remained employed. I continued to live at least some of my positive pre-diagnosis life. Through empowering me to keep speaking for myself, I became, I was able to self-advocate, not only for my own health issues, but for my future. And as Richard said in the presentation earlier today, why at a diagnosis of dementia would you want to stop having a future? We are all going to die anyway, and that's one of my sayings, you live until you die. It 
definitely reduced the isolation, the stigma, and again, I'll say there was no discrimination. And I didn't get depressed, ever. And my sense of identity is completely intact. In Adelaide, and there probably are a number of, um, in fact, I know that there are a number of side-by-side uh, -side projects around the world, but um, in Adelaide, in an aged care facility called Life Care, um, a side-by-side -side project was set up. It's a volunteering, a workplace engagement program that enhances quality of life, a volunteer program for people with dementia. I'm just going to catch up to my notes. So imagine if you or your partner, aged less than 65, lost a job, their driver's licence, due to younger onset dementia. How would you feel if that was you? Would you want to give up everything? So this was the question that a woman called Jacinta Robertson proposed by the South Australian Asian Community Care Provider, Life Care, which encouraged her to set up the side-by-side -side project. She described it as a different approach to service delivery. And she said, side by side enables people diagnosed with younger onset dementia to re-engage with the community by working one, by, one day a week at a Bunnings hardware shop. The concept of the project is to re-engage people with the community because they've lost so many things. It's a fantastic program. I know many of them, mostly men, a couple of women have done it, who said that if they'd realised that they could get support like they got at Bunnings, they would have stayed at work. When I left work, it's the only job I had in my whole career where I didn't get a farewell, I didn't even get a card. I walked out on Friday and everyone just said, see you. That was it. So there's an enormous amount of stigma attached to dementia and I, I, I likened it to what perhaps would be like being gay. I came out, I didn't hide it from anybody, I told everybody I had dementia because I felt the only way they could support me with, disability, with any of my disabilities was to know the truth. But what I question is, if we weren't told to disengage in the first place, we probably wouldn't need side-by-side -side projects. We probably wouldn't need half the respite centres in the world we'd still be living good, quality, meaningful lives. And remaining engaged with pre-diagnosis lives, I think it gives us the best chance of living well with dementia, keeps our quality of life intact. So I'd ask any of you who are working with people with dementia or caring for people with dementia, Please think about what they did before they were diagnosed. Don't discount what they were, what their hobbies were, <coughs> what their career was. Every room in a nursing home should have a person's career history, CV, right on the front door, so that people respect them rather than seeing them as just people with dementia. And I'd ask you to think about not prescribing disengagement if you are a clinician or in a position where you meet with a person with dementia at diagnosis. I really, really ask you to think about that. So I live every day as if it's my last, just in case it is. And that doesn't mean that I'm spiralling towards the end. We are all going to die one day and having dementia doesn't mean that you have to think about dying every single day. I can guarantee being diagnosed with dementia wasn't a birthday party, it wasn't that much fun, but I don't have to die now. Thank you very much.